Alina Polyakova. We are approaching the second anniversary of Russia's invasion. I want to ask your honest assessment of what the situation is in Ukraine right now. Well, in terms of the military situation, the Ukrainians are definitely hitting a very difficult time. Uh, we are facing a situation in which the Russians have doubled down. They've adapted their military strategy and tactics. They've dug in quite uh, effectively and they've adapted technically. So a lot of innovations that the Ukrainians had a competitive edge with at the beginning of the war, the Russians have now copied. And what we're really looking at is a situation in which the Ukrainians are desperate now for more military equipment, for more ammunition, uh, for more support from Ukraine's partners and allies, uh, which of course has been stuck in the United States now for several months. And without that support, uh, I think we're facing a very, very dire situation. And we haven't seen, I don't think, the potential worst of this war. There's a very good likelihood that the Russians are, as we speak, preparing another military affront on Ukraine there is a high chance they will once again try to take over the capital of Kiev, which we are very happy, of course, that Kiev was not affected um, at the beginning of the war. Uh, but this is not something that we can take for granted. So we're in a really critical point right now in terms of the military situation. Do you feel, obviously, Ukrainian people overwhelmingly reject the notion of partitioning? However, is partitioning inevitable and will it happen sooner rather than later? I think it's very difficult to say right now. I think certainly now I don't see a legitimate and credible space for any sort of negotiations that would have to happen between Ukraine and Russia directly with perhaps a mediating power in between. But certainly there's no negotiation to be had with the Russians right now. That may come in the future, but it has to be on Ukraine's terms. Right now it would very much be on Russia's terms and that's unacceptable. Ongoing debate about Ukraine's membership potentially for NATO. Lots of opinions on both sides there. You have argued pretty vehemently for Ukraine to be invited to join NATO. I want to ask you, what is the most cogent argument you've heard on the other side for keeping them out at this point? Sure. Well, I will just say it's not just me that thinks that the only path to Europe's long-term security is a Ukraine that is embedded in the EU, that is embedded in NATO. There is no other security guarantee that's not NATO for Ukraine. NATO is the only option. Uh, but I, the arguments on the other side, uh, which I don't find very compelling, frankly, is that somehow Ukraine joining NATO is the path to World War III. You know, in fact, it's the direct opposite. If we don't want a confrontation with Russia directly, which we don't, and the Russians don't want that, we have seen that NATO as a deterrent works so far. And again, we can't take this for granted. So far, NATO works as a deterrent. If we continue to allow these so-called gray zones in Europe, Ukraine not integrated, Moldova not integrated, Georgia not integrated, we open the door to a much larger confrontation in the long term. That's what really we should be afraid of. The situation now is winnable, it is manageable if we get our act together as the West. The only way to secure what have been very positive wins of Western support for Ukraine is to solidify that at the NATO summit by extending an invitation to Ukraine to even a session talks, not a formal invitation. We know that may be going too far, but the Biden administration, I think, has a real opportunity here to consolidate its policy towards Ukraine uh, with the NATO summit before the U.S. elections in November. Now, President Biden has already said that's not on the agenda for the summer summit. Do you think that's political posturing for the moment and could that potentially change? And what do you think could change his mind? I think uh, certainly there are many, including our European allies, especially those in the Baltics and the Nords, who are the closest to Russia and see the threat and have been raising the alarm bells. Even Chancellor Scholz of, of Germany has recently co-published an op-ed saying that we really need to focus on our military capabilities and this war is not over, it's our war. Um, and we need a Ukraine that's not going to be vulnerable. Because as long as Ukraine's vulnerable, Europe is vulnerable. If Europe is vulnerable, the United States is vulnerable. I do think there is uh, a pressure on the administration now to change their minds. I think the president needs to hear this from his counterparts in our allied member states of NATO. I think he needs to hear from those of us on the outside in the expert community. And hopefully 
that will help them see that there is an opportunity for leadership here and to solidify NATO's future, not just celebrate its past. Now, when we talk about the NATO member states, obviously they don't all think alike. And we see different messages coming from those who are closer to Russia in proximity. Do you see on the continent a rift growing and how does that resolve itself? It's been interesting. I mean, I think certainly we've seen, um, if, of course, if you include the UK and Europe, which I do, a, a bit of a crescent, if you will, form where you have the UK plus Nordic Baltics down to Central Eastern Europe speaking with one voice. But now we also have France that has come out, you know, President Macron has come out very clearly in favor of Ukraine's NATO membership. So the dynamics are shifting. You can't really say anymore there's a Western European view and there's a Central Eastern European view. I think many countries are starting to understand that this war is Europe's war first and foremost, and it is America's war. You know, whether the U.S. likes it or not, the rest of the world sees Russia's war against Ukraine as Russia's war against the United States and against the West. So it is America's war. And a defeat in Ukraine would be seen as a defeat not for Ukraine, but for the United States. There was one interesting point that you made in the foreign affairs article that you wrote uh, that I, I think would be interesting for our audience because they geek out on NATO stuff the, like we do, uh, that a big argument has been bringing Ukraine in right now could trigger Article 5, could push more NATO members into direct combat with Russia. But you actually say that's a misinterpretation of Article 5. That's correct. So Article 5, if you read it, and I, and I can't quote it verbatim yet, but I probably should be able to at this point. Um, what it, Article 5 initiation would mean that there would be a series of consultations among members who would then decide what would be the appropriate response, which could include a military response, but that's not the necessary default outcome by any means. Uh, of course, the only time we've seen Article 5 uh, activated was in response to 9-11. And Amer America's allies came to our aid, but again, not every single ally, right? There was a mix. Um, and the response was also mixed, I would say, in terms of contributions from our allies. So it's just a misunderstanding of how the treaty commitment works. It is not a path to World War III. Um, and certainly, while, while there is an active hot combat on Ukraine's territory, it's difficult to see full integration uh, of Ukraine into NATO. But we need to start doing the accession conversations. And I will say that NATO needs Ukraine. Ukraine has the most powerful military in Europe right now. NATO member states in Europe are far behind. You know, there is some countries like Germany will take decades to rebuild their military capabilities. Ukraine has a lot to offer. It's battle tested. Uh, they have capabilities from so many countries. They've put together in effective battle tested ways. There's a lot that Ukraine will provide to NATO, not just vice versa. I think we have to see it in those terms as well, not just as you know, this is some sort of charity for Ukraine. That's not what this is. Final question. As we look to November and the U.S. presidential election, to what extent is there pressure to get some resolution on the table before that election? And how do you see a Trump second presidency impacting Ukraine? Well, of course, it's impossible to predict, uh, one, the outcome of the election, but I think certainly what uh, a potential Trump presidency will look like. Uh, all we can do is look to the first term uh, and try to understand what would happen in the second. Uh, this may not be the most popular view. Uh, and despite what Trump has said recently about NATO, you know, they, he may believe that NATO's an alliance is unfair. He has said that many times, his views are quite clear. Can the US president just single-handedly pull out of NATO? No, Congress would never approve that. So if we look at the first term, you know, Trump, when he was president, said a lot of quite unhinged things. It was very damaging from a trust perspective for the alliance. But in terms of what the administration did, it, it really was not so damaging. In fact, we ramped up our spending on NATO's eastern flank. U.S. spent, I think, tenfold more um, on its uh, defense commitments to NATO. So, you know, it's not clear what would happen in terms of the trust having a potential U.S. president say the things that Trump said about NATO is a huge problem. But in terms of what would actually happen, would it be disruptive? Yes. Would it be catastrophic? I don't think so. Alina Polyakova, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It was my pleasure.